Nulle autre occasion ne permet de mieux se rendre compte du sérieux apporté à l'instruction de base. Le temps, limité au plus près de la réalité, laisse percevoir clairement les erreurs de manipulation de l'arme. L'homme doit apprendre à se servir de son arme spontanément et automatiquement afin de pouvoir viser immédiatement avec le plus grand calme et toucher. Hello and welcome to Bloke on the Range and this is episode 2 of 3 of Rifle Grenades of Doom with guest Dale, our tame Stromgrove 57 obsessive, so thank you for being here. If you haven't already seen episode 1, there's a link in the description below, please uh, consult it because it'll give more context to what we're doing here. So, today, what are we on? Today we're going to talk about the firing techniques. Ah. So both direct and indirect fire, and we're going to show them to you how it's done, what were the infield life hacks, so to speak, what were their problems, and how they tried to solve them. Now it's going to be a lot of death by PowerPoint, and uh, yep. I'm just going to relax and uh, leave you mostly in the hands of Dale here. Let's get to it. All right, so let's talk one about the one of the most important fire modes of the M58 rifle grenade. So just as a reminder, the rifle grenade family is a trio of combat ammunition. You had anti-tank, anti-personnel, and smoke. And each of them had their own versions of firing techniques and how they were supposed to employ, to be employed. Now, in the case of direct fire, it is mostly used against, as you can see in this nice little drawing, uh, generally firing in armored vehicles uh, with direct line of sight. Uh, the way I'm going to split this for you to understand this correctly, the, basically there were two main different techniques during the service life of the Gewehrgranaten Achtofinsk. Between 1960 and 1983, there was an initial technique that was replaced due to many reasons that we'll talk about later. And the results of these trials and improvements to increase the performance with this technique was the 83 to 87 technique. We're going to demonstrate that a bit later on. Now, first of all, what are the purposes? As I mentioned before, anti-tank fire at 100 meters. Now, interestingly, the original kind of a bit optimistic goal was to have a 150 meter effectiveness against a static target. That is really, really far. A tank is basically this size on your side picture. So I'm not exactly sure how they're trying to achieve that. But I guess with the first manuals being printed roughly in 1959, this is the very first edition of Das Sturmgewehr 57. And interestingly, the manual on the rifle grenade was a separate manual and was combined into one in the later 1961 edition. And here it states 100 meters. Although we'll see later on, even 100 meters is a little bit optimistic. Now, interestingly, you can also use the smoke and the anti-personnel projectiles in direct fire, although the cases would be relatively rare. Uh, the cases where you use smoke and AP would be, for example, in urban combat. Essentially, if you want to put a rifle grenade through a window or into a, down an alleyway, that's how you would do it, essentially. Now, because this is a direct line of sight type of technique, you have to break cover. You have to expose at least the top half of your chest, your head, to the enemy. And generally speaking for anti-tank fire, this is done uh, by with two men. So essentially pairwise firing. We're going to talk about this later on in the last video for training and doctrine. Now, let's um, rewind a bit in history and talk about how the firing technique originated. Basically, in 1944, the Swiss Army adopted uh, the rifle grenade model 44 for the Carabiner 31. So essentially, it worked with an add-on spigot, and the firing technique was rudimentary. These are ex excerpts from a 1955 manual, and the idea basically behind this, if I could please have the weapon, is imagine that this right here is a Carabiner 31. I can get you a K31. Do you want a K31? Let's go to K31. I'll get a K31. K31! Oh, the magic. So basically speaking, the firing technique was as follows. Just imagine that I have a rifle grenade spigot with a rifle grenade mounted on it. The idea is you definitely do not want to shoulder this. Because although the recoil is a fraction of what the Sturmgewehr's uh, rifle grenade is, about 98 Newton meters, about half the recoil momentum, uh, it's still a fairly good push or whack, I would say. So if you shoulder this, you definitely are going to end up on the ground. So the idea is to hold on to the weapon as much as possible, 
without actually putting yourself behind the weapon. It's kind of a weird counterintuitive theory. So the idea is just let the weapon recoil naturally and just kind of hold on to it for dear life and transfer the momentum to your actual upper body, which is much more massive. So the technique was as follows. Buttstock under your armpit, high pinch. You hold the handguard with your support hand and then you do what is called the guitar spiel, the guitar uh, sort of string playing, string plucking. Basically you have to stick your index finger in your trigger guard in such a way, like this, as shown on the drawing, that when the weapon recoils, the trigger guard cams your index finger out of the way. That's the theory. The issue is if you actually stick your index finger straight like this, you can intuitively understand that the weapon recoils, you're going to end up with a nasty finger bruise minimum. Now, interestingly speaking, uh, most of the injuries that came from the Carbiner 31 actually do not come from the index finger and firing hand, but a insufficient holding of the weapon on the support hand. So people would underestimate the recoil, they let go of the weapon, and they end up receiving the carabiner in their face. That's generally the issue with uh, these kind of firing techniques. And nipple rash? And nipple rash. Well, luckily for the carabiner 31, it has a very smooth backside. So you can actually uh, have a relatively good travel without any snack points, which actually isn't the case with the Stimgur. You got lots of bits and bobs sticking out of it. But in the case of the carabiner, it's relatively smooth which is again a bit of a problem because there's not much to grab on. It's relatively slick, so to speak. So you really need to hold that support hand down. You can see my fist is white and that's basically how you fire this properly with the carabiner. I didn't try it yet. Maybe someday we will get to show this on video if we get the authorizations for filming and using this particular system. A random trivia. The uh, 57 has an integrated launching spigot does not require a special permit, but a separate spigot for a K31 or K11 requires an exception permit because shame. that's what the law says. Exactly, go figure. Okay, so now that you have a bit of historical context, you can understand that when the Sturmgruber 57 was adopted, I guess they didn't really think much. They just basically transferred the firing technique over to the Sturmgruber 57. Okay, 1960 to 1983 firing technique. The regulation method was under the armpit, holding the barrel jacket. Now, the way I'm gonna break this down to you, I'm gonna show you the standing position using modern principles. Basically, the five fundamentals of shooting. Fundamental one would be body position. So because of the high amount of recoil, you wanna make sure you're low and very well forward, almost exaggeratedly. If you fire like this, you'll probably lose your balance and fall backwards. But in this particular case, you're nice and stable. Number two, holding the weapon. As I mentioned before with the Carabiner 31, the idea is to put as much of your body as possible on the weapon without actually being behind the weapon. Theory is as follows. The first point of contact is going to be the top of the stock against the inside of your armpit. By closing your arm around the stock, you actually pinch the stock in this area here against the inside of your arm and the side of the stock tube against your ribs. First point of contact. Second point is actually the barrel jacket. Um, it is favorable to not grab it in the front because the recoil will let the, let the barrel jacket slide and this might injure your fingers. If you hold it too much to the rear, you have too much weight forward, which is a bit straining. So the best compromise is to hold it somewhere in the middle. Fourth point of contact, which is important, is going to be the side of your thumb against the pistol grip. Essentially, you're pressing in and you're torquing the rifle into you. That establishes the contact with the rifle. So fundamental one, wide, stable position. Fundamental two, holding the weapon. Fundamental three, trigger control. Now, the winter trigger on the Sturmgruber 57 is extremely dangerous. Essentially speaking, this is the last thing you want to unfold and the first thing you want to fold again. So you would need to be extremely rigorous with your trigger control, basically following uh, firearms basic rules of safety, except you add an extra layer. Only unfold the winter trigger when you're ready to shoot and vice versa. If you don't want to shoot anymore, winter trigger up. Just to recap again, wide, hold, I want to shoot, winter trigger down, I don't want to shoot, winter trigger up. 
Second stage, I'm going to trigger up. I want to shoot, I'm going to trigger down. Second stage, I don't want to shoot, I'm going to trigger up. That's the basic idea. Fundamental four, breath control. Uh, basically speaking, same principles as on regular rifles. You all know the drill. Fundamental five, we're going to take them later, we're going to take a look at them later with the different pictures, is the sight picture. Essentially speaking, the theory behind this is to align the top of the rifle grenade, sorry, the top of the sight protector with the large diameter of the rifle grenade. And this constitutes, with the booster charge, your 100 meters zero. Without the booster charge, roughly 35 meters. Of course, for intermediate ranges, I don't know if it was actually practiced. You can use different areas of the front sight as referentials for intermediate ranges. For example, as you can see in the picture, for the bottom of the sight would be an intermediate range. So that's about it on my side for the firing technique. Let's move on to the Achtung Panzer drill. The idea is, suppose you're in a theoretical situation where you confront an armored vehicle on order or on your own initiative, transitioning very quickly to the rifle grenade and assuming the firing position. So I'll let Mike give me the signal and I'll try an attempt. Okay, so Dale is shooting at infantry, his safety catch is off, and then suddenly, Achtung Panzer! Yes. Should be within performance norms. I did fumble a bit when I unloaded the rifle. Again? Let's do it. Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it once more for, uh, for posterity. You want to use the... the... So, I love this. This is, it's such a horrible system, but there's certain little features that are so well thought I'm honestly not even sure if it's for that, but it's very it useful for it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, back to it. I'm even going to do the button up as an extra complication. That ceiling lid is such a pain in the ass. You have to break your grip and actually yeah. remove I don't. I'm not even sure if they actually did this in real life, yeah. but it makes sense. Yeah. Right? Okay, so Dale is engaging infantry with the rifle. Safety is off, naturally. Then suddenly, Achtung Panzer! Good job, sir. So yeah, you can see that the technique involved was relatively skilled. I mean, you need to have good coordination to nail these. Uh, now, just um, to show you, this is the firing session, the first public firing session that we did at the Waffenplatz Chamblon. Uh, and essentially, we had the privilege of shooting at an original tank target at 35 meters. Now, I'm not gonna show you the effect on target. That's not the focus. The focus is analyzing what mistakes I did in this particular uh, demonstration. Now, just for context, uh, during, we had about one hour to make 20 people try the system. So we were a bit short on time, so I had to really rush through it. And the idea was to shoot two rifle grenades as a demo, essentially speaking. So just imagine the setting, I have about 20 or 30 people staring at me in an open range setting, and this is the result. So here I did it in slightly slower than usual. So weapon down, magazine out, and first mistake, I did not unload the rifle. Yes. And I absolutely have, well, looking back, I did not realize everything. My world was just gray. I was just focused on getting that grenade to the tank. Screw the unloading procedure. But jokes aside, I mean, of course, when you charge the weapon, you eject, hopefully, the chamber GP11 and you replace it with a rifle grenade cartridge. But, you know, better be safe than sorry. Am I right? Well, I mean, in your defense, you started with an unloaded rifle. So the, the, it, Dale did not put the rifle in an unsafe condition. However, had it been real and there was a Warsaw Pact tank going down, coming, bearing down on you, well, you had. It, was, it would have been a brown trouser moment either way, but you would have had the rifle in a state with a ball round behind an anti-tank. Not recommended. Grenade. Extremely dangerous. So first uh, screw up is I actually did not execute the complete 
unloading drill, which would have taken five seconds more actually when I think about it. A bit of fumbling on the magazine, that's normal. Smooth insertion, I like that. Good position, but here's the problem. Dale forgot to remove the safety. Aha. I would have been absolutely turned into Gruyere cheese, or actually Emmentaler cheese, by the uh, tank's coaxial machine gun by that point. Because the yeah. problem is normally, as we've shown before, you're supposed to take the safety off as you rise and assume the firing position. And this is something that I completely forgot to do. And I got caught pants down. Yeah. Yeah. But it's uh, just from a general... I'm an ergonomics geek, and there's all sorts of ergonomic weirdness on this rifle, partly because they developed it so quickly in its rush, but the safety catch on this is, is like an afterthought as to how it works. It's in the wrong place, it's, it works the, in an odd way, um, and that technique to bring your hand over is to compensate. It's basically, it's a cope Essentially, for a yeah. very, very bad, rushed safety catch selector position. So you can imagine my surprise when I was ready, my, my body was stable, I had my perfect sight picture, and I pressed the trigger and nothing happened. It wasn't a very uh, glorious uh, moment of my life, but then I quickly realized it, and that's when I made my third mistake. Did you see that? With the winter trigger unfolded, that is a major safety violation. You know what could have happened? ND. In my rush to assume the firing position, I accidentally pressed the trigger and without being ready, let the shot fall. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is a great example of what not to do. Uh, this is an absolutely disastrous demonstration when I think about it. And it goes to show that this is actually a very complicated drill for a militia army. Yeah, that's true, yeah, the amount of skill involved, well, actually, they probably would have drilled the heck out of it, depending on how skilled they were, but damn, in a stress situation with, you know, just a bit of audience, not even a real tank, all the fundamentals yeah. get tossed out of the window. Yeah, Pretty but, crazy. I mean, but this isn't a skill that would have been practiced often, this would have been practiced on repeat courses, which were, what, three weeks long every year, exactly. typically, and it would have only been a part of, it would have been like a range package or two during the repeat course. Um, that's a complicated set of drills. I mean, you, if you think that the, the, the SA-80 reach around, load, <laughs> unload, make safe drills are complicated, that's nothing compared to the rifle grenade drill here. Hi, yeah, yeah. but at least the rest of it went relatively well. No major mistakes there, let me show you. Winner trigger up, that's good. Down and flip, rifle grenade on. Bit of fumbling as usual. Charge energetically up. You can see the thumb already on the winner trigger. We're down and fire. Winner trigger up and we're done. So yeah, um, it's kind of embarrassing to uh, show this as a first public demo, but at least it was an interesting learning. Uh, there's a lot of stuff to be taken into account when using that drill. Now, let's talk a little bit about the problems behind uh, this particular firing technique. The first one is very evident, the strong and sharp recoil. With the booster charge, according to official internal technical reports, the recoil is rated at 225 Newton meters. That is a lot of recoil. I think a Barrett 50 cal is, I think, 60 Newton meters or something like that. Don't quote me on this again, need to verify this, but it's significantly more than just a standard firearm. Simply put, you're ejecting a 1.16 kilogram at a V0 of 50 meters per second. It's definitely no joke. And so if you do a little bit of math and you kind of extrapolate, okay, the shooter is kind of half a meter wide and the torque applied on him, basically he gets 115 kilograms force of felt recoil. Uh, a lot of former militiamen say this is 80 kilos of recoil. I don't know what that means uh, from a physical perspective, but it's, it seems to be a number that floats around. Uh, 80 kilo de pousse, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, I guess it's maybe soldier FUD lore that gets uh, transmitted from generation to generation. But I guess the point is that it's, there's a butt ton of recoil and even the official figures show it. And the problem is, as you've seen earlier on, 
with the firing technique that allows a high degree of freedom of movement of the firearm, which was its original intent, unfortunately, this also means that with relatively um, shaky-handed militiamen, there's a high risk of injury. Now, generally speaking, it floated around the 20 to 50% per training session. Oh, per training session, not per grenade. <laughs> 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 it's still relatively significant. So let me just show you an account from uh, a militiaman that I had a lot of correspondence with, uh, Mr. Bacardi. Now he did his basic training in 1985, so that's already with the new firing technique. And according to him, I asked him directly on what the injury rates were, what were his perceptions on how people were injured, and his response was, we would have been happy with only 20% of injured men. I, I quoted him the official figure, 20%. In reality, it would have been half at every training session. There hasn't been a session without injuries to the nose, teeth, chin, forehead, cut hands, cut fingers, swollen wrists. I must have done it a dozen times and not always without tears. You can see how strongly he felt about this subject. Now, of course, we need to nuance this a little bit. The official figure of 20%, we don't actually know what constitutes an injury according to official reports. It might be a bruise or a cut, may be considered an injury to the average person, but maybe to uh, the army senior staff is not considered an injury. So we must be careful. Uh, it's just to illustrate the point. Essentially, this rifle grenade system was vastly unpopular, essentially speaking. Now, just to balance it out, this is kind of a, a publication from a, an official uh, magazine called Schweizer Soldat, and it's officially a repost of uh, Martin E's diary and in his diary there's an interesting passage that I could read out to you a high point for both combat squads was the first rifle grenade shooting session these rifle grenades known as Uges have a somewhat dubious if not infamous reputation this is due to injuries caused by incorrect handling but also exaggerations and anecdotes of heroic shooters now how much of that is actually this chap's opinion and how much of that is part of the official coping program? I would say it's a bit of both. Because what is interesting, if you look at the date in 1967, it's basically the transition point to when the training program was reforming. And so it's interesting to see kind of these uh, procedures applying to the actual soldiers. Now, of course, there's a certain part of mythology to it. Can you imagine it? If your uncle or father was part of the generation that was trained on this and they have all sorts of horror stories, imagine your father tells you the story, it would have been half of injury every training session, and you start your recruit school with this in mind and being confronted to this actual system, you start pissing your pants before you even start firing your first rifle grenade. So you understand this cascading, this negative cascade of feedback, and this results in relatively poor performance in the field. And that's what I found pretty interesting. Now let's talk a bit more formal. This was relatively you know, informal stuff, but the subject matter of rifle grenade direct fire was taken extremely seriously um, because it was deemed to be a valuable anti-tank weapon. I mean, to put into perspective, it was the most common anti-tank weapon available to the average infantryman in terms of sheer projectile numbers. Uh, you had roughly 300,000 of these rifle grenades compared to roughly 150,000 rockets and even less anti-tank projectiles, so on and so forth, for anti-tank guns. And so in terms of density, it had the highest potential. And therefore, it was deemed serious enough that many uh, NCOs and officer associations and academies, which were pretty common at the time, in order to keep the army moving forward, they actually uh, made a inter very interesting report on the real-life observations of this anti-tank rifle grenade, how they could improve it, and what are the issues. Now, essentially speaking, uh, Mr. Bracher essentially wrote a report stating uh, how this could be improved. And he said, first of all, in Manual 53100, which is considered the Bible of the Stringer 57 for the average infantryman, or NCO in this case, no mention of muzzle safety distance. Well, that's a bit unfortunate, because the thing is, if you watch the episode on the technical part, you know that on the anti-tank rifle grenade, you have a built-in electromechanic muzzle safety. But the problem is, nobody knew how long was that muzzle safety. And this is extremely valuable information. If you were to use this system, you want to know what the minimum engagement range is. But it is never stated in the manual. 
Practical testing, according to the report, showed that the reliability is achieved at 100% at roughly 15 meters. So that's kind of the minimum arming distance required for this particular projectile. Next, no details on individual or collective use. The manual is extremely basic about it. It just says, on your own initiative or on order, you prepare and you fire the rifle grenade. There's no mention of the tactical use. There's no mention of what situations you use, which formation or whatnot, nothing at all. Third, outdated trajectory and sighting tables. And that is pretty bad when I think about it. Uh, the sighting tables essentially remained unchanged from the very first 1959 edition. And don't forget, the rifle grenade pattern changed in 1964, so the ballistics were completely different. Didn't this come up at Chamblon? Indeed. What we notice in Chamblon is that we followed the, uh, the manual to the letter. 35 meters, we even measure it with a telemeter just to make sure that we're at 35.00. And somehow, over a sample size of 20 shooters, we all hit low, universally, either on the tracks or just in front of the target. And I wondered why. And it turns out that the firing tables were completely outdated. I'm going to show this to you later. And of course, no information, firing angles, nothing. Basically speaking, uh, the opinion of Bracher is that the rifle grenade must be treated with as much seriousness as an anti-tank gun. The average infantryman must know what the characteristics of his weapon is, uh, are, excuse me, what the trajectory is, the firing angle, etc., etc. Now here you can see the actual real-life firing tables, and they differ from the ones in the manual significantly. And to respond to your question regarding Chamblon and hitting low, aha, it turns out that the real range of these is actually 30 meters, so no wonder we were hitting too low. The target was five meters too far, with the same hold, of course. And what is interesting is that the actual ranges differ significantly, and this kind of was a proposition for correction to the GRD in the 1970s. There are other more kind of formed opinions. Uh, they're both positive and negative. I could say that Bracha's report is more positive. He is more optimistic about what the capabilities of the weapons are. But if you take this report from Mr. Verli, Für eine Verstärkung der Infanterie Panzerabwehr, around the same year, to be honest, he is definitely a bit more negative in this particular aspect. The range of this weapon is still completely insufficient. The moving tank stays within range for only a few seconds. Above all, however, it is not hit. That has to do with the fact that the shooter receives a violent blow when firing the rocket gas is flying to his face. This is why the hit rate is so low when shooting with a booster charge. In combat, the hit probability is, is undoubtedly much lower, mainly because the tank looks much more terrifying at such a short range than at rocket launcher range. Shooting with this weapon takes exceptional courage in war. In addition, there is further serious disadvantage, the fact that switching to the propulsive ammunition is too cumbersome and time-consuming. So from his perspective, it's a dead end. Perspective of Mr. Devec around the same uh, year. Indeed, the rifle grenade cannot hit a moving tank more than 60 meters away. Oh, wait, wait, wait. you'd be saying, didn't the manual state that this was supposed to be used at 100 meters? Well, it turns out it's more of a 60 or 50 meter weapon. We'll detail that later. But you can already see here, it's pretty evident. Only the best shooters are able to hit in these conditions. What would be the results if these soldiers are under the fear and nervous stress of combat? That's food for discussion. And so, when I read these reports, I got a feeling that there was kind of a consensus that the rifle grenade was not what it was supposed to be. Uh, essentially speaking, it was sounded nice in theory, uh, but the direct fire mode needed to be seriously revisited and, and uh, improved. And I guess that it was serious enough that the actual senior staff, the senior army staff, subdivision of training, or Gruppe für Ausbildung, decided that it actually mandated an official study. And this study is, in my opinion, kind of the pivot point on how the rifle grenade direct fire technique evolved. Now, this uh, formerly declassified document examines the handling of the M50 anti-tank rifle grenade in a war mobilization context, so the worst case scenario, the most realistic scenario. Um, basically speaking, 
you just use the militiaman's residual training, so to speak, and you simply confront him to a real life situation and see what the hit expectations are. Sample size, roughly 200 soldiers, and it's interesting because they selected different skill levels of, uh, of troops, so to speak. Motorized grenadiers, grenadiers, which are considered, you know, cream of the crop infantry, and of course, a standard rifleman company. Basically speaking, grenadiers are trained probably three times as much on the rifle grenade as the average rifleman company. Um, they're basically trained three times as much at, in everything, including, uh, you know, things like climbing and such specialty things because they were considered the army elite. So basically, I think the idea was to see if there's a difference in skill depending on the degree of training. And the program is very simple. Six exercises, two rifle grenades on an 18 kilometers per hour moving target. Very simple. Program was echelon as follows. Everybody starts at 60 meters. If you get more than three quarters hit rate, you move up to 80 and then 100. And if you suck, you move down to 50 meters. That's how they basically establish different skill levels of shooters depending on that day. And the results are, well, they kind of speak for themselves. This is probably the most damning conclusion in this entire report. Essentially speaking, the, the findings of the report stated, in a simulated war mobilization, on the first appearance of a moving armored target at 60 meters, 55% did not hit within two shots. They missed both shots. More than half of the 200 troops on the first appearance of a mobile target did not hit the target within the allotted time and projectile. So that's absolutely disastrous. Those that could hit on the first shot, only 23%, and those that could hit on the second, roughly 20%. Absolutely terrible statistics. Even worse, and that's a separate statistic, out of the uh, about 200 soldiers, 10.5% were considered injured. 4.5% cannot continue shooting. Now, the report didn't detail exactly what happened to them, but I can imagine that if you can't continue shooting, something pretty significant has happened. So that's another pretty poor statistic right there. Uh, what is interesting also is seeing how um, the different kind of training echelons of the troops uh, impacted their results. And you can see uh, that I don't really see a correlation, to be honest. But you can see that grenadiers tend to be slightly more skilled than the riflemen, both motorized and standard grenadiers. So the training does indeed have an effect on the hit rate, but you can see that still... Not a lot. Not a lot, exactly. It's not a lot actually, um, you know, achieved the standards, most of them are still unsuitable, just a bit less. And the injury rate, interestingly, in the Grenadiers is only one, compared to 11 in the motorized Grenadiers and nine in the rifleman section. So maybe it requires more statistical analysis. I'm no st statistician, I'm just reading the conclusion. In my opinion, it's pretty damning. I mean, just, just looking at this, absolutely terrible. Um, <clears throat> more from a training perspective, what was noted during the study is that they noted down 75 handling mistakes. Shouldering, which is the big no-no, was noted three times. Holding the pistol grip, which at the time was not actually a regulation, noted once. So that means the training was completely insufficient. What was interesting as well is that they noticed that as the troops underwent more exercises, so more sessions of two shots at a moving target, the hit rate increased. So that means that the more the troops trained, the better the hit rate. That seems pretty clear to me, which means that in the first place, the training is insufficient. That's actually fairly substantial improvement over substantial, a relatively yeah. few number of shots, showing that they weren't getting enough shots in the usual training. Exactly. Uh, they, they were not getting sufficient training. That's really interesting. And so the conclusions, I mean, you saw the data, it's not very good. The M58 anti-tank rifle grenade is not a reliable anti-tank solution. I mean, the report was very clear. Because in actual combat, the dispersions will be even bigger, basically twice uh, the, the dispersion in this kind of sterile exercise uh, setting. And so you can imagine all these results would be even more further downgraded in a combat stress situation. 
They also noted that a new aiming device, and that's a, some foreshadowing there, and intensive training can definitely improve the hit rate. I mean, you saw the evolution of the hit rate in relation to the amount of exercises, but there's a problem. It costs. The issue with these rocket boosted projectiles is that they can only be effectively used once. And that's a big problem because while well, the rocket motor can only be used one time and when you're finished with the rocket motor in one session, you have to pick everything back up and ship it back to Tune for refurbishment. And so essentially the amount of ammunition you ordered could not be reused. You're stuck to the fixed amount of ammunition. And this means that there's a great shortage of these rifle grenades, unfortunately. And you can see the costs of actually refurbishing these. If you take with the booster charge, every single refurbishment costs 22 francs 30 in 1972. And that's roughly times three for inflation. I mean, that's a lot of money. It's like, it's like what, 66 bucks for every single use. And there are hundreds and thousands of these rifle grenades in circulation. You can see right here, it says in 1972 alone, they used 450,000 of these rocket boosted rifle grenades. And that's a lot of money. Huh? Now you might say, okay, why not substitute the training with low cost, reusable, unboosted rifle grenades? Well, the problem is it's not realistic. You don't get the same recoil profile. You don't get the same ballistic trajectory. Essentially, the only purpose of these is to simulate uh, firing indirectly with the obturator and kind of as an introductory projectile for the first rifle grenade firing, which means that you need a high number of these expensive and sophisticated projectiles for training, which simply did not exist. Third point, uh, this is kind of a uh, more foreshadowing the M58 anti-tank rifle grenade must be successively replaced by the rocket launcher. That's their opinion. However, it will remain as the individual self-defense means against static targets. And so this is kind of where the narrative shifted. The initial optimism of the rifle grenade essentially died off. Initially, it was fantastic. Everybody has an anti-tank weapon. We solved our anti-tank defense problem. And I guess after this report and after it cascaded down the hierarchy, the perspective kind of changed to, okay, this is kind of a useful emergency situation type weapon uh, for ambushes, for urban combat, not against full out open field Warsaw Pact type of attacks. So that was an interesting learning from their perspective. And subsequently, <clears throat> excuse me, voice crack, subsequently, the practice ammunition distribution was reduced. So the strategy was, and that was also due to budget cuts, by the way, which led to a contraction of the amount of, of practice ammunition, which is terrible timing because the report just stated that more intensive training is needed. So a two-fold strategy was proposed. One was to overall reduce the amount of rifle grenades in circulation, but concentrate the amount of these rifle grenades to specialists. So that was the beginning of the era of specialization. Instead of training all troops on a multitude of different tasks, you select the very best, and then you train them to death on this particular system. And you can see how this evolved throughout the years. This is per man. We first started with 12, which is a decent amount. And this was contracted to a bit more over than four in 1976. And so all of these formations received extreme cuts in the amount of rifle grenade shooters, especially in secondary non-combatant roles, I mean, not, not directly, such as fortress troops, communication troops, and mechanized light infantry. And therefore, per rifleman company, you would specialize 25 direct fire shooters and 15 indirect fire shooters. How big was the Swiss rifleman company at the time? I think it was 70 or 80 at the time. Depending. That's fairly small for a company compared to other armies. Exactly. And it depends on their the formation and on the type of, uh, of role, but that was about the average number. And you can see it's, it's pretty crazy. Uh, the, the drastic downsizing, it was, before it was just train everybody to Rambo with the rifle grenades. Now it's focus on the people who can do it best. And that's a really important part in this particular story. Now, as you can see in 1976, and that's after the report was published, Rifle grenades are considered as psychological emergency weapons because although from a technical perspective it wasn't the best anti-tank weapon, from a morale perspective they considered it a booster. 
because think about it, you have the reassurance that you can take out a significant armor vehicle almost at any time on your own initiative. That's a big morale booster. And so therefore it states in the report, its psychological effect should not be underestimated. Okay, so basically, the Army Training Department found itself in a crossroad. What do we do to improve this hit rate? Because that's their main purpose. We want to make sure that basically we have return on investment. We invested so much money in this system, how do we make the most out of it? The first problem that needs to be addressed is the gross aiming technique that we saw earlier on. That was trialed with, uh, sorry, that was attempted to be improved with new aiming technique or a device. Next is the extreme flinching induced by the heavy recoil. You can see it on some archival footage. You can see some people close their eyes and you can even see the rifle shift before the weapon actually fires, which is not very conducive to good precision. What about a new shooting technique that alleviates this kind of stress? And also, how do you improve the training? So it's these three axes that the, the, the training department tried to focus on to change this. So, quick question. Did everybody get at least a go with rifle grenades? Or, mm -hmm. uh, because uh, obviously you've got to identify who are the guys that are going to be specialists trained on it. But uh, It's actually a good question because it still remains open to this day, but I speculate based on the documents I have so far that every single rifleman was expected to be at least skilled in unboosted rifle grenade firing. And for those that demonstrate uh, exceptional hit rates with this unboosted rifle grenade, can be voluntarily transitioned to the boosted rifle grenade. That's the way I understood it. That seems fairly sensible. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, it's a win-win for everyone. It's a, you save time in training and you save money in training because you don't have to see people blasting their, their hands off while firing these, essentially. Let's talk a little bit about something that was uh, unfortunately forgotten uh, during the Sturmgeber 57 service life. It's about this mysterious rifle grenade leaf sights. And these are extremely interesting in my opinion. Never published before as far as I know. This is an excerpt from the Bracher 1969 report and interestingly he sketches in his report the very first concepts of rifle grenade leaf sights and it seems to have been um, two different pipelines from two different entities. This particular one was, uh, I think, an, an attempt by the Schieß-Schule Wallenstadt, which I remind is kind of uh, the equivalent of... Uh, Hive. Yeah, the, exactly. Or the, back in the day, it's, it's the, basically it's the infantry school. Exactly, the infantry school. So they were kind of responsible of the practical aspect of weapons. Yeah. In, all, in, all the, um, <clears throat> in all the old documents, uh, it's the place where they do all sorts of testing with various rifles and techniques and things. So Precisely. kind of the equivalent to what, Hive, what the small arms school of Hive was in the UK. Exactly. So just to give you a bit of, a, of context. And uh, apparently, according to him, Wallenstadt has tried a, a rifle grenade sight of this pattern, apparently. And they also tried, and this is speculative, this is from a, a CML patent drawing. They have used a rifle grenade sight that attaches on the plastic fin. And it's essentially a single-use disposable system where it basically just detaches upon firing and you just, it's, it's basically packaged with every single rifle grenade. This was a concept that we used with the uh, West German rifle grenades on the G3s. Mm. And it was a system that was patented by CML and licensed produced to Hispano Suiza. So I suppose that was something that was tried. Now, it seems that this initiative kind of caught the attention of, of the, the Gruppe für Rüstungsdienst. Now, essentially speaking, the KTA, which was the Kriegstechnische Abteilung, the entity that was responsible for army procurement of material, reformed and was dissolved to create the Gruppe für Rüstungsdienst. Uh, essentially, the way I understood it, I, I still need to research this, apparently it was to give less political say to the actual you know, acquisition of material, basically to separate the political aspect and the technical aspect. Now the GRD is solely responsible only for the technical and financial aspects. All the deciding part has been, you know, removed somewhere else. Before the Katia had to deal with this as well, and it was a bit of a mess. But back to the point, the GRD, the Gruppe für Rüstungsdienst, uh, in July of 1969 came up with the first provisional requirements for a rifle grenade site. And just to summarize, the biggest improvement that was needed was to improve the field of vision or the field of view. Because when you do the regulation firing technique, your line of sight is essentially obscured by the big rifle grenade head. 
So the idea was to either move the sight line up to get more real estate for more field of view, and we'll see how they actually did that later on. Faster and finer aiming. The problem with the original technique is that you have very good perception of um, you know, alignment in this direction, but not really in windage. Because the problem is the sight elements are extremely gross. And so unfortunately for the targets that are extremely far, it's a bit complicated. And of course, no modification to the service weapon, easy installation and removal, but it has to be at the same time robust. Waffenfabrik Bern in 1969 was mandated, and this was their first iteration of a rifle grenade leaf sight uh, to respond to these technical requirements. And I got to say, it doesn't exactly significantly change from the original technique. It's just that you get more ranges beyond 100 meters. The original sight line has been uh, retained. And you can see the way it works is that it slips from the front of the rifle and it's radially indexed in place by the bayonet lug. Pretty clever design. Um, I have no idea how this performed well. I mean, you can see here you have markings for both the anti-personnel and the anti-tank rifle grenade. So it's kind of a dual use sight because the diameters were different. Your hold was also different. As far as I could tell, this design was not very successful. They transitioned to a, a more conventional design. You can see right here, same application, but this time with this little doodad right here, which was supposed to be some sort of front sight aiming post, so to speak. I can see the obvious issues <clears throat> with that. Yeah, that it's a bit weird, isn't it? So the idea is instead of, imagine the front sight being unfolded here, imagine instead of aiming the traditional way with this line of sight with the head here, you aim right here. So the line of sight has been moved up so you get more real estate and you basically have a standard notch and a post just like on a pistol. Okay. Next variant, same thing but with a plexiglass scale. That's interesting. Another experimental version. And another one as I showed before with the little windows and a little arrow on top. Eventually what was retained was the so-called Stangenvisier 72, the model 1972 rifle grenade leaf sight. This thing is absolutely fascinating. I had the privilege of handling one of the very last physical examples at the Military Museum of Fulhoyenthal. And for those of you watching, I highly recommend a visit. Their collections are absolutely breathtaking. And thanks to the curator, Tobias, he allowed me to personally handle one of these rifle grenade sights. These are absolutely crazy. Essentially, they kind of departed from the previous uh, kind of concept where it is fixed and now it's a foldable design. So it's, desi so it's designed to stay on the rifle and to be folded and unfolded depending on the situation. It's absolutely massive. Uh, basically speaking, this thing was the length of the barrel jacket. So you can understand that when it is unfolded, it protrudes this much from the rifle. You can clearly see it here. <laughs> it's absolutely, it's madness. Uh, you can see the way it is fixed. It basically, there's kind of a, a horseshoe, essentially, and it's indexed in place cleverly by the bipod detent spring for the forward position. And there's a kind of a bottle clasp that kind of wraps around the barrel jacket and it keeps it in place. Pretty clever. Um, the way it works is that there's the hinge right here. It's basically an aluminum rivet, and then you can unfold it. This is absolutely huge. You have to use three arms to unfold this. And then there's a, another bottle clasp right here that wraps around the front sight, and that's what keeps the sight in place from folding itself when you actually fire it. Absolutely crazy. Can stuff. you actually use the rifle sights with this installed? Uh, no. <laughs> this is a significant flaw in the design. Uh, here you have a window, but you actually can't see through because that front sight post is blocking your aim. So in case you're caught pants down, um, I guess you're a bit screwed. <laughs> simply put. Uh, let me show you exactly how it's done. So here I have a picture of it folded and installed on the rifle. You can see it's actually quite elegant. Uh, I like the way it looks. And uh, there's an issue with that is that the bipod can't be slid in the forward position. So you're basically stuck in rifle mode. It's not that big of an issue, but you're kind of trading a functionality for another. Uh, the problem that I see with this handling this, first of all, is extremely light. I think it was 200 grams. Uh, for the volume, the sheet metal used there, I think it was 0.35 millimeter sheet metal, it was extremely thin. It's, 
This is this isn't getting any better, Dale. No, this is getting worse. <laughs> I had some optimism when I saw it. I was like, wow, that looks like some pretty useful thing. And the more I started playing with it, the more I realized that it's probably a good thing to never adopted it. Some foreshadowing there. The problem, first problem that I noted, you can't unfold this thing one-handed. <laughs> okay, it's better. Ooh, Let well. me explain. At first I expected, okay, you simply have a small spring detent and you can just go clunk and then you can open it. Easy, right? If you're in a combat situation, you can simply unfold it like this. But turns out, no, no, because you have a positive retention catch, this little doodad right here that holds it locked. Absolutely dreadful. That means that you have to break your grip and consciously with your support hand, pull the tab out and at the same time unfolding it. With a Warsaw Pack tank with bearing a Wars down on you. <laughs> with supporting infantry. Terrible design. I have no idea what the heck they were thinking, but that's just the way it is. There's a positive catch and you have to pull it out and it's extremely small, so you can't really do that with gloved hands. And then unfold this whole thing. And then again, this bottle clasp arrangement that wraps around the front side that I was talking to you about also needs two hands. You have to reach over the front side, make sure that it's well positioned and then close it. You can probably do it one-handed, but it'll take a lot of practice. Um, probably you would also drill, unfolding this on top of drilling the Achtung Panzer drill. Well, plus it would have been core material, so it's not, not even something you could practice at home in front of the TV. Precisely. Even worse, it's core material, and so nobody cares for them, and so they'll probably not even last a few months of service. I mean, just one impact, and this thing is absolutely screwed. That said, it is very comfortable to use because of the higher sight line. This means that your aiming position is much more natural. Instead of crumpling over the rifle, you now can relax your neck and just kind of look at it more naturally. Less likely to get the rifle in your face. Exactly. I guess that's one extreme improvement because that sight line has been moved by what, like 20 centimeters, which is significant. And the sight picture is surprisingly crisp, I gotta say. First, I was worried that all these windows and doodads distract me from the sight picture, but in fact, no, you can pick it up quite easily. Thing is though, you look at it wrong and it's gonna get bent. Exactly. This thing, I mean, just look at all these protruding elements. The sight, the front sight is literally protruding like, like that this. That knitting yeah. needle as a front sight. That, <laughs> you look at that wrong, you breathe on that wrong and it's, it's gonna be bent. Oh my God, so it's hilarious stuff. It was indeed very educational, very fascinating. Very Heath Robinson. Yeah, it's crazy, huh? Uh, also, interesting anecdote, this also had illuminating inserts. Uh, they painted the numbers, I hope, not with radium paint. And the front side has a little, um, a little doodad to help you with uh, sort of dusk and nighttime engagements, if you can even see the targets in the first hand. So yeah, that's a very interesting anecdote right there of the M72 sight. And the way I understood it was that uh, the tooling for the sites, because this is all stamped sheet metal, requires expensive tooling, was pre-ordered for roughly a few um, 10,000 pieces, or, or roughly, and the project was shut down. The official justification was that the GRD did not have the time and money to spend on frivolous gadgets. That is possibly the best description of that. It is a <laughs> frivolous gadget, very much. Uh, yeah, uh, troop trials were positive, well, in sterile conditions. Uh, it was more precise, it was more user-friendly, as I noted, but again, on the long run, as militarily speaking, when just... you when you compare that to the various sites on 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 say Yugoslav Yugoslavian uh, SKS, mm -hmm. it's just completely Heath Robinson. It's crazy. Or the 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 Enega sites on a foul and, mm -hmm. or, or number four or whatever. That they just it's just so <laughs> bad in comparison. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's pretty funny. I mean, it's kind of this uh, forgotten weapon Swiss edition, honestly speaking. This thing is absolutely hilarious. But yeah, just to be sure, the project was shut down relatively brutally because it also coincided with the period with the budget cuts, as I mentioned earlier, in the 70s. And so these kind of purchases are not exactly justifiable. Um, yeah, long story short, unfortunately, um, this basically is a museum piece now and um, you just have two dudes talking about it on some YouTube video. Bit of a shame. I'm probably no one watching by this stage, but <laughs> if you are still watching, please like and subscribe, and please uh, leave a comment in the in the in the description in the description. Leave a comment in the comments for engagement purposes, etc., etc., etc. Sorry for that terribly uncouth intervention there. 
Do carry on. That's no problem. It's for archiving reasons, right? Okay, so basically speaking, the, the rifle grenade leaf side was shelved, and so the only thing that you can do is improve the firing technique. One unofficial life hack was to actually use the sling as extra support. The idea is uh, the Sturmgewehr 57 has a steel hook as kind of a sling to adjust the height of the rifle in relation to your body. And people realize that you could also use this to help with rifle grenade handling. So all you have to do is jam it in one of the barrel jacket ports, pass your support hand through it, and basically brace the sling against the front of your chest in such a way that the weapon kind of holds itself. You can see I'm releasing my firing hand and this is holding on just fine. Now this technique is nice, but this did lead to a few broken slings, uh, which is a bit of a problem. <clears throat> and it still wasn't steady enough, although it improved the ergonomics. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Broken slings. Yes. That's a great way to parameterize quite how much the recoil is. These are no, not insubstantial is, leather slings. That's an old cow right there, and that thing just broke it apart. No, I mean, no issues whatsoever. <clears throat> 200 Newton meters. Wow. And so in 1973, I guess, they realized that the firing technique needs to be improved. Trials were undertaken. And interestingly, different techniques were trialed. And you might be shouting at your screens, wait a second, didn't you just tell us that people were ripping their index fingers off? Well, yes. And I guess they just decided to start over and actually fire rifle grenades while grabbing it by the pistol grip. Let me just illustrate that. like this. It worked, but it placed a lot of undue strain on your wrist and your thumb uh, joints. It was noted that the hit rate was exceptional. It was 80% at 70 to 85 meters. So the trials continued. And one of the improvements, allegedly, was to further introduce firing from the bipod. So not only do you support it like this, you also use the bipod as frontal support. So not only do you have better recoil control by diverting the recoil energy into your poor wrist, you also make the weapon steadier by placing it on the bipod. And push down hard. And push down hard. And even better, the Swiss pioneered the grip clamp C. Uh, yes, <laughs> from our friends at Polonar. Way before, uh, say, the modern uh, people came with their uh, inferior copies. And so, in 1983, this so-called new technique was introduced, uh, as I've shown before, and um, I guess it's time to actually demo it. We're going to show you exactly what we're talking about. Okay, so post-1983, the technique, as I mentioned before, drastically changed. Uh, it's interesting because the manual also mentioned that firing from prone is possible, so let's try it out. The idea being that you hold the pistol grip just as you would with a regular rifle, and basically pinch this under your arm in such a way that you orient your joint directly in line with the rifle, if that's even possible. Now there are two variants. The regulation variant is to do a grip clamp, grip clamp C, excuse me, on the handguard and push down with all your might. And now I've assumed the side picture, I can now fire. The second variant, which actually is kind of a derivative, the problem with this particular technique is that when the weapon recoils, the bipod has a tendency to slam against your thumb. And so a variant that came was to grab the front of the barrel jacket instead, kind of in the middle, and still be pressed down this particular way. So those of you who have served after 1983, you can understand what I mean. It wasn't the most pleasant firing technique. Never tried it personally, probably never will. Okay, so... Yeah, you saw this fire technique was absolutely different, complete departure from the previous one. As you might have noted, it probably was indeed much steadier than the official one, the previous official one. But there were definitely some problems, and you can see this particular still image, what the problem is. The amount of wrist injuries and contusions shot up. Uh, the issue is that although the manual states that you have to make sure that your wrist is in line with the rifle. Unfortunately, the compression really damages your joint over time. And uh, there was kind of this phenomenon that was nicknamed the UG thumb, 
especially with people that have sprained their thumb due uh, to improper um, holding of the weapon. And it was so bad that even the official manual, Manual 53-100 edition 1983 states that there's going to be a limit of how many rifle grenades you could fire in one session to avoid injuries. Without the booster charge, you could fire 10. With the booster charge, only five. And officially the reason, and I'll translate this directly, indeed, after a certain number of shots, and depending on the resistance of the wrist joint, we realize that during the firing position, sometimes you have uh, increases in, in uh, you have a loss of concentration and an increase in loss of stamina, essentially speaking, that translates to uh, higher injury rates. So that's the official version. So it already tells you how bad it actually is. Because the issue is, if you undergrip this, your thumb gets the recoil. If you overgrip this, it'll twist your wrist to the other side. So not exactly the most convenient of all of firing techniques. So that marks the end for direct fire. Uh, this inter interesting and uh, pretty scary firing technique, which I personally never tried, I, would ne I never will try it, uh, kind of soldiered out until the end of the rifle grenade's service life. So now we're going to move on to indirect fire. What are the purposes of indirect fire? Primarily for firing behind cover, smoke and anti-personnel up to a range of 400 meter boosted, 140 meter unboosted. Generally speaking, the most optimal usage of indirect fire is through salvos, so implying group firing. So this is basically using it as a mortar. Exactly, just an organic mini mortar short range. Because I, I believe that the minimal engagement range for mortars at the time was a couple hundred meters, and therefore this kind of filled the gap between hand grenades and company mortars which makes it actually quite useful. The individual firing technique. Are you ready for the demo? Mm -hmm. Okay, let's talk a little bit about indirect fire. Uh, now you can see I already prepared the rifle for the rifle grenade as I did show you in basic handling. Uh, essentially all firing is done with the bipod, sorry, the rifle stock on the ground. The first thing to do after you finish setting up the rifle grenade is to set up the actual plumb line. The way you do this per the regulation method is actually detach the sling and put your plumb line on the sling loop. Now of course there's a variant where you put this on the bayonet lug. The issue with that is that it's actually slightly offset to the sling loop and this results in aiming errors unfortunately. So in this particular case I've been ordered for example firing with the booster. So in this case I would use the leftmost bipod leg, which is scaled for this particular distance. I would set up the bipod leg in such a way that it is relatively square with the rifle, and I can now start with the plumb line. Plumb line is simple, just a standard M61 or M51 soldier's knife, and I can affix this to the actual sling loop. Now I actually do a little trick. I just invented this myself, because here I have a multi-stranded loop, I can simply put this around the front sight. It's faster than having to do a knot and simply fold this over. So as you can see right here, I have my famous inclinometer. Let me orient it towards the camera. And you can see that this is not something easy to do. This thing has a tendency to flop around. So essentially you have to control this particular doodad right here. And you can see I'm aligning with the marks. For example, if I want to shoot at 325, incline at 325, and call it the day. Now to actually aim this and orient this one man is a bit convoluted. As you can see on the slide right there, you're supposed to select an auxiliary aiming point behind the target and a kind of aiming mark in front of the target and kind of coincide these three together with the axis of your weapon. Now how this is done operationally, I have no idea. I suppose that the idea is to kind of stand more behind the rifle in this particular way, it was common to stand relatively straight. But then the issue is, it's difficult to see your plumb line. And also, you're very close to, you know, 800 bars of hot gases bursting out when this thing fires. Not very pleasant. Now that I showed you the plumb line, let me show you the actual correct position to hold this in indirect fire. The idea is you're kind of kneeling and sitting on your foot at the same time. You can see that the only place that actually physically supports the rifle is your support hand right here, which is resting on top of your thigh, just like this. 
So right here, the weapon is nice and steady. The idea is that you would, at the same time, aim, orient the rifle to the right angle, and at the same time, touch the round off. In this particular case, simply by actuating the winner trigger like this with your thumb. Same principles as with direct fire. This is the last thing you unfold and the first thing you unfold for any subsequent manipulations. One important thing to mention is the use of the obturator, which I'm going to demonstrate with this unboosted rifle grenade. The obturator is com comes packaged with the rifle grenade on the ceiling lid itself, because either this one has been shot once. Now, in an ideal situation, you would prepare your rifle grenades in such a way that the obturators would be already in your pocket. If that's the case, if you want to shoot short range or low velocity mode, you would place the obturator on the muzzle and then seat the rifle grenade on. This obturates the rocket motor, thus making the rifle grenade fly slower. For two men firing, the position is slightly different. When you're firing this alone, you're more towards, close to the rifle at least. But with two men firing, assuming that the camera is actually the firing assistant, you're more standing to the side, in the sense that the actual assistant is holding the same plumb line as I do, and aligning the base of the stock with the tip of the rifle grenade to the actual target. In this particular case, I have to clear this line of sight and in case corrections are needed, simply pivot about the rifle like this. The stock basically does not move. This method is definitely more accurate. So you saw, yeah, it's, it would have been nice to have some sort of sight, just like a mortar, because just pointing it like this, but we were surprised to see at Chamblon how well it worked. Um, because with an assistant that has also a plumb line indicating where you're pointing, it's remarkably accurate. I mean, of a sample size of 20 shooters, we, were, we had a group about the size of this room, which is roughly 5 by 5 meters. This is quite astonishing. So let me just show you uh, the video of the, the demo shots that we did for indirect fire. Préparé tirage trajectoire courbe. Infanterie. So yeah, it was remarkably smooth. I was, we, we were, I mean, me and my assistant, we were extremely surprised at how well the results went. Um, interestingly, you could hear the projectiles whistling as they came back down, and you can feel the impact through the ground. It was, it was pretty crazy stuff. Now, how do you aim with two men? Uh, that's an interesting problem. And as we showed early on in the demo, you kind of just coax it into alignment. But apparently, according to the manual, there are several kind of sub-variants of how you could do this. Either the assistant has the direct line of sight with the target and you are firing behind cover, or you actually rely, kind of do like a little peekaboo essentially of the target with an auxiliary aiming mark, or you use closer auxiliary aiming marks or aiming references, or if in case of urban combat, you can even mark a line on the wall you're firing against and simply use this as a reference. It's a bit far-fetched, maybe needs to be tested in theory, but there are a lot of different methods on how you could shoot these accurately. Now you might also wonder, in case you were in a squad and you were to use this, you can't dedicate each shooter one assistant. So from a manpower perspective, it doesn't make sense. So generally, operationally how it's done is that the squad leader directs the fire, and generally speaking, all the shooters are lined up either in the column or in a row, and basically the squad leader controls and orders the firing. So it's more sensible in that matter. 
Now, for two men aiming, uh, you have to correct because the problem is uh, the errors resulting from alignment amplify over distance and it's kind of difficult to get the right shot the first time. And so efficient communication of instructions was extremely important. Uh, initially, in 1961, the official way of doing it is by observing the impact and communicating the appropriate correction to the shooter in meters. So essentially, if you landed five meters to the right, you would say, shooter, five meters to the left. But there's a problem with that. So let me first show you a little video of it in action. You understand the problem behind this particular uh, correction. How exactly do you translate these corrections to movements on the rifle? Um, and another problem is, how do you interpret 5 meters? Everybody has their own subjective perception of 5 meters at a certain distance. So we'll talk about how this problem uh, cascaded itself in the later years. So that's the main issue. The, the corrections were incomprehensible. I mean, saying five meters, 10 meters confuses everybody. I mean, with range, it's sensible because you can just add 10 meters on the, on the scale or subtract 10 meters on the scale, but left and right, particularly as you're going to have disturbed your position entirely to load the next grenade and cock it, it's like you don't have a reference point at exactly. all. Because all you're doing is looking at the scale for, 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 for distance and listening to links, rechts, go stuart, and, <laughs> and then uh, foyer, bonk. It's pretty crazy stuff. So they eventually solved the problem in 1964, and that's pretty interesting. And we'll talk about this later on. Another issue was rudimentary aiming. Uh, if you do this one person, as we showed earlier on in the practical demos, you're basically right behind the rifle. There is no sighting system whatsoever. So it's kind of a trial and error, um, basically. If you're two people, at least you have a bit more precision because you have a second reference point. But if you're firing this alone, and many people believe that firing this alone was the best way to go because it required very little manpower and preparation, very difficult to aim properly with this. And just like for the direct fire, the Swiss tried to solve the problem by adding more equipment. And it's interesting the amount of iterations they went through to introduce an indirect fire site that never existed. The Generation Zero solution that was considered even before the rifle was officially introduced was the M58 Neigungsmesser, or the M58 sight. Slant measurer. Sl yeah, slant measurer, exactly. Interestingly, this device was tested for rocket launchers. Uh, the idea was, of course, you won't do indirect anti-tank fire, but you would use this for illuminating projectiles, for example. And the KTA uh, deemed it was a good solution to transpose this solution to the Sturmgewehr 57 for indirect fire. And in July of 1958, the first request went out and a cascade of several different prototypes uh, were introduced from 1958 to 1959. And the final iteration is, as in this technical drawing right here, basically they're a big fan of bottle clasps, by the way, they have a huge fetish for it. It is fixed onto the middle of the barrel jacket via a bottle clasp. And there's, for lack of a better term, a housing. And inside you have this kind of a ranging disc with the various markings on it, all over it. And there's a counterweight on the bottom and a ball bearing in the center. Basically, depending on your angle, the disc is going to rotate, the ball, uh, sorry, the counterweight wants to, uh, is being pulled down by gravity, and then the corresponding a marking is being projected to the shooter via magnifying glass. So very convoluted uh, way of doing it. Uh, and so during trials, it was noted that it worked okay, but Waffenfabrik Bern kind of lacked a bit of insight, and they simply put arbitrary numbers that did not reflect the real range. So it didn't help with the first impression. Second problem was that it was only one scale. Don't forget, these rifle grenades have a short and long range mode, so they require two scales. <laughs> and <laughs> basically, Waffenfabrik Bern didn't think this all the way through. Uh, now, of course, 
you could improve the construction. But eventually what led to rejection was when Wallenstadt introduced their technique with the plumb line, with the, the simplified plumb line and the graduated bipod, and simply put, there was simply no purpose to pursue these trials anymore. But interesting anecdote. Okay, so fine, we got the soldier's knife and the wonky bipod. How exactly do we deal with this? And there were so many weird and unusual proposals to try and improve this. I'm going to show one of these to you. I kind of grouped them in what's called the Meyer proposition. So Mr. Meyer actually wrote an article in, I think, Schweizer Soldat or ISMZ, one of these main uh, soldier magazines, on how to improve the accuracy with one man shooting. And his, his idea was this. So apparently, you have to map out your entire target zone in 2D on the ground. And with the tip of your plumb line, you essentially align the plumb line on the markers, kind of like a pre-siding, and like this, you would get optimal results. But there's a small issue. <clears throat> Every time you fire this rifle, the stock bounces up and your referential is lost. So you have to start again and find that center point because once you shift it, your map is completely useless. So this technique didn't catch on, understandably. Second one, okay, fine. We, we kind of magically solved this issue by locking the stock to the ground by, some, by digging it or burying it in place, which didn't work very well. Another one which was used during, uh, during night shooting was to take a rifle grenade packaging tube, which is a cardboard tube, you stick a flashlight in there, so you make some sort of spotlight, and you project it in such a way that the rays of light coincide with the stock of your rifle, and therefore your assistant can see the light being filtered by the stock and can align to it. Okay, it's very complicated. Didn't catch on either. However, interestingly, this idea of pre-sighting the target kind of was retained in the manual called Nachtkampf, or night combat shooting. And their idea was to uh, stake into the ground two wooden poles to kind of define the center position and to rudimentarily put wooden blocks as designated aiming points at night. So you can simply fire in these directions for supporting, which does have some validity to it. But I can understand operationally, these stakes won't last very long. Well, oh, and, and if the ground's soft in the slightest, the rifle's going to sink, sink in and you're exactly. Done. In fact, it was common that during extended sessions, your rifle grenade just progressively sinks into the ground and you have to pull it out with a shovel. Next one, which is extremely interesting from a historical perspective, is so-called the Fackermaya device. Essentially speaking, Lockmaker Helmut Fackelmeyer, which lives in Zurich, unfortunately he passed away uh, not so long ago. It would be nice to talk to him about this. But completely on his own civilian initiative, he decided to develop an indirect rifle grenade sight. According to his, uh, his writings, he said that his first impression of rifle grenade firing was extremely inaccurate. And so he had, being a lock maker and being very competent in mechanics, he started sketching up and drawing up these concepts of a, of a weird uh, sort of clockwork-like device. And he even filed a patent for it, in fact, two patents for it, in the, in the 70s. Now, he had good connections with, uh, with officers, and of course, since the army was so informal at the time, it was relatively easy to get access to uh, top brass, and so his invention caught the attention of, uh, of the relative, uh, sorry, the appropriate departments. Now, the way you see this, it's, it's really complicated. You basically have a prism inside, you look through it like this, and basically there is a kind of a, a reticle. You basically turn the entire dial, and this shifted the prism, and this is how you get your actual line of sight. It's really complicated. Is anything not complicated in this weapon <sighs> system? I, I'm not even. I'm trying to look for something simple, but everything that pops out seems extremely complicated. Uh, interestingly, the device was tested for a very long period. Uh, there was even an official, sort of semi-official manual that was printed for it, and you can see how it was locked inside of the barrel jacket. It kind of just grabbed onto the, the orifices of the barrel jacket. And uh, let's just say that we'll see later on how it was trialed, because it was relatively interesting. In parallel, some other dude called Wachtmeister Hammer, basically, uh, what's the equivalent of Wachtmeister? Sergeant? Uh, it's sergeant or similar. It's yes. A 
basically an N NCO, it's right? It's a relatively high NCO, yeah. Ba basically, an NCO Hummer basically decided to introduce this weird aiming stick. Um, there's basically no other way to describe it. It's, it's essentially just a camera tripod right here with a little ball turret. And there's a very long, meter-long stick right here. On this meter-long stick, you have what is essentially kind of like the Stringer 57's bipod and a separate plumb line. So the idea is this. You would orient the stick in both angle and direction towards the target you would like and you basically fix it in place and you simply have to place the rifle parallel to the stick and that's how you reach the target. The theory is relatively sound because it allowed several men to be aligned parallel to that reference stick and so you get relatively good results quickly. So that was the main idea. Interestingly, Waffenfabrik Bound picked up on this idea and further developed it to this particular prototype right here dated 1972. They call it the Richtstab, so orientation rod, essentially speaking. And so these two solutions were trialed roughly in 1972-1973, and let's just say that the army wasn't really convinced with them. First of all, the stick had an inaccurate scale for some reason. It is easily bent, obviously, and it is unstable. Any passing breeze, falling branch, or foreign body would absolutely ruin your adjustment in, in a jiffy and you have to restart all your work again. So definitely not a device for a combat situation. What about our fancy little Fackelmeyer device weighing it at a whopping 300 grams? So it's not sig insignificant weight. Uh, this thing, insecure retention, disassembles upon firing due to its mechanical complexity. In high humidity, the prism kind of clouds over due to condensation and plus, you actually have to have a direct line of sight with the target, which kind of defeats the purpose of such a sight. And it is uncomfortable to use at longer ranges because the more the range is long, the more you have to tilt the rifle. And since your sight is somewhere in the middle of the jacket, you have to stoop over, which is extremely uncomfortable to use. So let's just be very blunt. Both of these were firmly rejected. And what's interesting was the exchange that followed between Fackel Mayer and the army staff. Basically, they had to break the news to him that his device was no longer considered for adoption, and he, he protested. But yeah, unfortunately, none of these devices see, saw any significant use. On the topic of incomprehensible corrections, and that was the only sensible solution that was adopted, is so, the so-called NIF method. So instead of stating uh, how many meters arbitrarily you're hitting, instead you would use finger widths, because NIF magically discovered that most humans have relatively similar finger widths. And so what you would do is that you would compare the impact to the actual aiming point, and you would say two fingers to the right, and the shooter can immediately use the same reference point and apply the correction. And so this new solution was adopted, and all the manuals printed after that date reflect this change. So. Really, it's something that's low cost and simple that was adopted in the end. And so, ladies and gentlemen, that marks the end of the firing techniques. So, oh, thank you so much. And uh, for all you out in internet land, that's, uh, that's it for today. For us, we continue, because there's a, a third chapter to film. Uh, thank you so much for watching, if you survived this far. Well done. Thank you, Del, for your absolute wealth of incredibly in-depth knowledge on this Thanks, stuff. Um, it was a pleasure to share. Oh, thank you for sharing on, on my channel and, and, and coming to, to present all this stuff to everybody. It's, uh, it's fantastic. It's far more in-depth than anything I ever do. So thank you so much. So thank you all to viewers. Thank you all to patrons who keep the channel chugging along. And uh, see you in the next chapter.